Hello and welcome to a brand new Arsblog Arscast, right here on Arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. I'm pretty sure everyone is feeling quite good from a footballing perspective right now. Certainly when you compare it to this time last year, I think the mood is just ever, ever so slightly different and better. And long may that continue. Obviously, you take nothing for granted in this Premier League of ours, but when you look at the fixtures, when you look at the way we're playing, you can't help but feel just a little bit excited, just a little bit optimistic about what we might do this season. And um, I finished the the all or nothing thing. I'm not going to give away any spoilers or anything if you haven't had a chance to uh, to see the episodes i'm not going to go into specifics when it comes to episode seven and and certainly episode eight which it it opened up some old wounds from last season it's it's fair to say because you know come last may i sort of put everything into a box and said look that's it Never think of this again, and we'll go forward, and hopefully we can use the positive things from last season and take them into this season. I think so far we've done that, but it's hard not to think that some of the disappointment and disheartenment, disheartenment, the fact that we were so disheartened because we came so close at the end of last season, I... I know it really stings. And when you watch those episodes, those final couple of episodes again, I'm not going to lie to you, it will sting again. But I also feel like it's it's still there within the squad, within the team, within the club, certainly in the manager, that this is this is part of the positivity that we're experiencing now in a weird way. Like it's motivation. It it hurts, so let's make sure it does not hurt the same way again. And that might be me looking for a silver lining or or whatever it is. Um, I'm not making any excuses for the end of last season or anything like that. I think there were reasons, et cetera, et cetera. But part of how you grow, how you develop as a team is, is experiencing things which you do not want to experience again, that give you that extra bit of motivation going into a game or whatever it might be, or going into a new season. And, um, you know, new additions with all that on top of it, uh, I think that is playing a part in where we are and where I hope we're going to go. We are facing Bournemouth this weekend on Saturday evening. We will talk about that game a little bit more over on Patreon when we look ahead to that. Mikel Arteta's press conference takes place tomorrow, Friday, so we don't have any real team news or anything like that yet, though we did see Emil Smith-Rowe and Fabio Vieira play for the under-21s in midweek, which is good to get them closer to 100% fitness and to make our squad better and stronger and everything else. But we will talk more about the Bournemouth game over on Patreon. A bit later on, I will give you the winners of our competition from last week, uh, a wonderful Thierry Henry print from Noah McMillan. I told you the story of that last week, so we'll give away that a bit later on, but let's get on with the show and let's talk about some of the things that are are making us happy and making us excited, and making us optimistic. And with me to do that is Philippe Auclair. Hello, Philippe. Hello, Andrew. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you feeling about the start to this new season after a good preseason, two wins? Uh, how, how are you feeling about everything from an Arsenal perspective before we maybe talk about other stuff? Well, I'm feeling um, I'm feeling good. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling I'm feeling James Brown. I'm basking, as we were saying. Yeah, because I think it's a it's a nice time to bask. We don't have many occasions to bask. To be true, we haven't had many occasions to bask for a while. So this is basking time. What has encouraged you most about what you've seen, perhaps through preseason, but in the opening? two games what 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 do you think is the the standout feature uh, of the team itself you, rather than going into individuals because i'm sure we'll come to those in, in a moment mm. but is there anything about the team itself a sensation you have even something that's almost intangible but that is giving you the the kind of the basking shivers if you like <laughs> i think um i think the focus is is perhaps better than it had been last season when um, the teams seem to go through uh, peaks and and troughs uh, throughout the same game some in a completely actually uh, bizarre mysterious almost unexplainable fashion where for 
10 minutes, they would simply disappear, then they would come back and mm. you think, hmm, I don't know exactly what's going on here. And what I've seen so far, and obviously, you know, it's it, the, the friendlies were, were good. Okay, but they're friendlies. Uh, but the two games I've seen uh, in the league, and um, and I was uh, at, uh, at the Grove for uh, the game against Leicester. Uh, I was basking in the heat there. Yeah. And um, I, I found that there was, yeah, a kind of resilience perhaps that hadn't been quite there. There was great energy going through the team. Um, you sensed the team that was fresh physically, uh, a team that, um, again, had um, great focus, uh, excellent concentration defensively. Not perfect. I mean, there are plenty of little things, on them, little and not so little things which can be improved upon, but... Um, and also, the, the connection was there with the crowd, which was absolutely wonderful to see, and uh, which is something which came to the fore last season. You know, I think when we had this really good uh, series of results before Christmas, the crowd started to to get really behind the team, and it hasn't looked back since, despite you know a few few disappointments and even disillusions we had on on the way. Um, but yeah, um, they, they are intangibles. I'm also almost talking like Mikel Arteta, you know, in his um, speeches um, <laughs> <laughs> to the to the team before before the games. Always the same speech and always the same words: focus, passion, energy, and energy from the from the start. And you have got to, at the same time, you know, you hit the palm of your hand with your fist, but. Uh, the message seems to be getting across. And obviously, there have been some truly tremendous individual performances um, throughout the team, actually. Yeah. And um, which which bode well. I, I do think that we now have, which we haven't had for a while, a proper spine um, from keeper to centre forward. And I, mm. as you go through the team, you think, yep, that's working, that's working, that's working. And also, I'm looking at... You know, I'm looking at our bench. It looks better than it's done for quite a while. When you think that, all right, we have a problem at left back, uh, not because we haven't got a left back, but because we've got two very good left backs. Um, that hasn't happened for a while. I'm not saying it's the, the puzzle is complete. And I'd love to see, uh, obviously, Vieira in a, you know, play for uh, for Arsenal and see what he can bring to the team because, mm. you know, I, I have high hopes in, in this young man. Um, we could probably do with an extra midfielder, maybe some more competition at right back, even though uh, it seems that Ben White has really taken to um, to the position extremely well. And you think, actually, no, uh, we've got, I wouldn't call it strength in depth. We're not quite as deep as other squads. Um, but uh, it's not just 11 players. I think we've got about 15 or 16 Yeah. Who- genuinely have a, a claim to be in the first team and who will feel disappointed not to be there. It was It's certainly deeper than last season. You know, there's yeah. no two ways about that, where we were running on fumes because we were basically using 12 or 13 players. And, you know, when Vieira does come back, and it was nice to see him get some minutes during the week for the under-21s, 45 minutes, mm-hmm. Smith Rowe as well. You know, when you're rotating and when you're looking for players to come on and do something from the bench, to have Smith Rowe, to have Vieira, to have Eddie, you know, to have that little bit extra uh, on the bench to change games as and when you you want to do it, I think is going to be very important, of course, this season. Um, but you, you mentioned some individuals, and I know there's a very, very obvious one that we're going to yeah. probably touch on. Uh, and I, we're going I, to there, bask about. We are going to bask about, um, you know, one part of that spine that you mentioned. But at the other end, whereas I think uh, Ben White and, and Gabrielle were an effective partnership, and, um, you know, I'm not in the... I'm not in the sort of, right, we've got something new, so let's cast away everything that's old uh, mindset by any stretch of the imagination. But you must have been mm. extremely impressed with the uh, the debut from your compatriot, William Saliba, and yeah. uh, his subsequent performance against Leicester when he made a mistake, scored mm. an own goal, didn't let it flush to him or, or anything like that. And the the... Look... It's early days. We're trying not to get carried away with things. I get that. I absolutely get that. And you can't really make definitive judgments about a player based on two performances. But what I think you can get is a a sense of who they are as a footballer and what kind of character they have, what kind of qualities they can bring to a team. And there is 
obvious, obviously, uh, many physical attributes that a six foot four central defender who's quick over the ground, who's strong, uh, will bring to a team. But I think there's a seriousness about this young man and the way that he is approaching his career. Um, and his time at Arsenal, he did well on loan. He was serious about those things as well. Mm-hmm. So you must have been impressed with him, even though I know you've you've kept a, uh, a close eye on him when he was uh, playing for Marseille last season. When he was, um, I think, one of the very best players for, for Marseille with Boubacar Camara. Um, and um, yes, I mean, I think like everybody else, I was... I wasn't anxious. Uh, I was looking forward to discovering whether he could transfer that kind of form in a league where, uh, which is quite different in terms of intensity and in particular in terms of um, the way that the attackers play. Um, league 1 is is the league in, in Europe, the major league in Europe, in which players do the less or the fewer, fewest, I'll get there, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> high intensity sprints in the uh, the last 30 yards. Strange, isn't it? Weird. But so, yeah, and, and England is number one. So obviously for a defender, that poses a completely different problem. You see, the, the context in terms even of the game that he's actually played is different. And also there are still some teams which, and we will see about that, but which use, um, you know, aerial threat, but he dealt that very well against Crystal Palace. Then we saw him against a, a super quick uh, or used to be a uh, number nine uh, against Leicester. And he looks completely unflustered. And I think that's what has been striking all of us is the calm um, yeah. of, of this young man. Uh, he's 21 years of age. It's ridiculous. And I, I'm going to quote a name here. I know you might not like the reference, but he was a bloody good defender in his time. And I heard him being compared in the way that he approaches the game uh, that he makes people think of a young Rio Ferdinand. And I have to say that's, that's pretty high praise because Ferdinand at his best was, was an absolutely magnificent defender. But the same thing is that the physical attributes are not what he relies first and foremost to do his job as a defender. Uh, it's his placement, uh, his sense of interceptions as well. I, I don't know if you've noticed that, but yeah. there have been some. I mean, like, and, and it doesn't look like it's a, a hurried sprint or anything. No, it's like, okay, I'm just going to put the... Uh, put the turbo on for, you know, over 10 yards and I'm going to cut the trajectory of this ball. It's going Mm. to be clean. I'm going to control it and I'm going to pass it to a player and I'm going to choose the right pass. If I can pass it to, and he was looking for Saka, for example, quite often and always found him. Um, If, uh, on the other hand, he thinks, no, that's not quite on, he would look for his midfield or otherwise he would actually just go to Gabriel and say, well, that's your flank to take care of. Mm. And not trying anything particularly fancy, but trying things which are actually bloody difficult to master. And yes, he looked he looked like a really uh, he looked like a Rolls Royce. Uh, yeah. and it's just and and the own goal, he had to do something about that ball. It's just bad luck, nothing yeah. else. Yeah, I mean, look, and the, actually the way the and the way the public reacted, the crowd reacted to that was yeah, it just was amazing. wonderful, it was wonderful, amazing. It really wonderful. It really was, and I think that speaks to something wider about the way, you know, everyone is feeling about the team and the fan base and the sort of unification or reunification yep. of the fan base in a way. Uh, you know, there's a desire to get behind the team and to see this, in inverted commas, project uh, succeed because, you know, if it does, we're all going to be, you know, happy days. But I'm reminded of him and I know, look, uh, you made a comparison hey, and I'm going to make another, sorry, I, I'm going to make another quick comparison because I was reminded of, you know, a quote that you um, dropped on this podcast maybe a few years ago. I can't remember exactly who it was you were talking about, but it's that famous uh, Paolo Maldini quote where he says, if I have to make a tackle, then I've already made a mistake. Yes. And and just in relation to his positioning, his reading of the game, like I'm not saying William Saliba is the new Paolo Maldini uh, before anybody takes me out of context here, but <laughs> what I am saying is that that those elements of his game you know, they tie in very well with that kind of mindset where you can get yourself out of out of a lot of trouble or potential trouble in a way that maybe many people don't actually see during a game. So a, a sliding tackle where you 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 chase down and you you know you slide along, you hook the ball away and you come away with it, it looks brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um but there are other ways to defend effectively without those I don't know, showy moments, if you like. 
showy moments which often uh, prove that uh, you were not positioned properly. And um, it's it's William Gallas um, who was uh, I was talking to I think maybe when we um, are mentioning Paolo Maldini, but William told me and he, several times actually he said that in a way when he had to do a tackle he'd failed in his job. He said honestly I shouldn't have to do the tackle. It's really pleasing for a defender to do a great tackle. Uh, it's wonderful the crowd loves it, but it's much better to prevent the player from that you're marking from receiving the ball or intercepting or puts physical pressure on, on that player so that he actually miscontrols, whatever. All these things are much more important and, mm. and show you know how good a defender you are if you don't have to resort to the tackle. But he can also tackle. There was one against uh, Zaha, uh, uh, on Zaha against Crystal Palace, which was just a, a thing of beauty. I think they but got, a, um, they got. did they not get a free kick afterwards because there was an earlier foul by, it could have been Ben White, something like that. There was one in the box, but there was another one outside the box as well, mm, where I yeah. think Palace got a free kick because there was a, a previous infringement. But yeah. So, yes, I mean, uh, I think we can carry on basking uh, about Saliba as well. And, um, and the way that he's... Um, Yes, he's gone back into the fold, you know, after all these years spent on loan, also speaks of a player who's got a very clear idea about his career path. And um, I, I'm going to say something which is a bit silly and, and, and old school, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But one thing is that he, like his teammates, um, he looks like an Arsenal player. Uh, it doesn't look like somebody, like some have grown into it. I think Martin Odegaard, for example, now really looks like an Arsenal player. Um and, and it's something you could say of almost the whole team. I know it sounds a bit strange because, after all, they they wear the shirt, they they play for the for the team. They obviously, uh, uh, give a lot for for that shirt. Sure. But they do feel like they have got a connection to the club that hasn't always been obvious in some other players we've seen wearing that particular jersey. And uh, and I think that runs through the team as well. Yeah. And um, and which is of course as as you know a spectator in the stands is something that you feel immediately, immediately, mm. and 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 the connection is incredibly strong because basically you think well you know they they're one of us basically, and uh, which I also think that in a way, and we're probably going to touch on that, the uh, timing of uh, the Amazon show with the start of the season. Mm. was perfect because I think all of the you know, all Arsenal fans have now watched the series um, and all of them I think will have been struck by how much they care, how much Art attack cares and how much many of those players do care far more than perhaps we thought they would and so that's also strengthened the bond and, and so now what we've got to do is use it and exploit it. And we've got a decent run of fixtures coming, which sure. honestly in the past would be have been enough to make me absolutely terrified um, <laughs> by saying we've got not easy games, but winnable games coming. Yeah. And um, so let's use this as a springboard. And uh, I, I cannot see anything at the moment which really makes me genuinely worried about about the, the fixtures to come. You Thank know, you. that's an amazing thing. And I was only thinking this the other day that, the, you know, there was a time where you could look at the fixture list and say, OK, maybe this Arsenal team isn't perfect, but that's a game they, they're going to win. We'll win mm -hmm. that one. We'll win that one. And we've gone through a couple of years where you're just like, well, literally anything could happen in this game. <laughs> we could win, we could draw, we could lose, uh, we could play well, we could play poorly, we could be indifferent. And it does feel like things are beginning to knit together where you can look at games. And again, not taking anything for granted. This is the Premier League. If you drop your standards, you will get exposed and teams will punish you. There is that amount of quality in the league from top to bottom. But when you look at an Arsenal team and you think, if we play to our potential today, this is a game that we should take three points from. And I, I've found that a, a very nice sort of step forward. And it's, um, you mentioned the documentary, The All or Nothing, and I don't know if you've seen all of it yet. Um, and I don't know if anybody uh, or if everybody listening will have seen all of it yet. So I'm conscious I don't necessarily want to give away uh, spoilers, if you like, um, beyond the fact that episode eight is, is hard going. <laughs> it opens up some some very old wounds. But 
what struck me from episode eight, again, without going into any details about what happens, you know, after the fact, when we see some of the reactions and see some of the things that didn't go quite as well. The spine that we mentioned, Gabriel Jesus, uh, and maybe we'll talk about just him specifically in a minute, but Zinchenko as well. One thing that, that struck me was I can see why beyond their individual quality as footballers, those were players that Mikel Arteta and Edu and whoever else was involved wanted to bring into this team, not just for what they can do on the pitch, but for how they might impact the mentality. Mm -hmm. Like this is still pretty much a, a young team. There are some experienced players in it, but it's a young team. And I made the analogy on the blog uh, today, Thursday, that, that these guys, beyond what they give you as footballers, it's sort of like an injection of growth hormones for your dressing room. <laughs> Careful here. <laughs> yeah, well, look, I, I, I mean it in the um, in the best possible way and not necessarily Indeed. the how on earth can that Champions League winning team run that much in every single game uh, throughout an entire season, right? Uh, I just I just mean it from the point of view that it's a lot, almost like a cheat code. It, it sort of helps bring these guys along because of what they can bring from their experience at Manchester City with the players they played, with, with the coach they worked under, with the mindset that exists at that football club, whatever else you think about it. You know, there is a sort of winning mentality right through it. Um, you know, these guys are going to be really, really important in the development of this team on and off the pitch. Yes, and uh, obviously um, there was one person who was perfectly well-placed to to know about this, mm. and it's Mikel Arteta. So there's absolutely no doubt there is personal picks. Um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, they... they this idea of the bringing in the, the, the winners, the winning mentality... Uh, is absolutely crucial. And um, also, I, I think that when you, whatever you think of Manchester City, and we think a lot of things about Manchester City, not all of them very nice, um, but it's certainly a team in which um, the collective uh, matters far more than the individual. And in fact, I would almost say that the individual almost doesn't matter, uh, even mm. if you're Kevin De Bruyne. So in a way, they're perfectly uh, attuned to what uh, Arteta is doing, because he has exactly the same principles. And even if he doesn't quite have the same um, philosophy, game philosophy as, as uh, Guardiola, uh, I think he, in a way, um, he's not as mechanical in his thinking mm. as Guardiola is. Um, but he certainly has brought in players who, who, who partic you know, uh, for whom this uh, team ethos is totally natural, as well as the winning ethos. Mm. So... And you add to that the fact that one of them is a very good footballer, uh, Zilchenko, and the other is a super footballer, <laughs> obviously, Gabriel <laughs> Jesus. Um, I still can't quite believe. I mean, I, I, when the first rumors came, I thought, no, it's not possible. It's not going to happen. It can't happen. It would be too nice. It would be too good. Um, and also what we paid for him. Which is ridiculous. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? When you put it crazy, you think about yes. in the striker market to get that guy for forty five million, whatever it was. I you know, I know sometimes you lose sight of how big forty five million pounds actually is, but in the market that, that we exist in, it's it's a yeah. bargain. It is a complete bargain, absolutely. And it's and he's proved it and uh, he's going to blossom. Um he's already blossoming, but um so we now have to pray that uh, he doesn't seem to be injured too often. I mean, sorry, I'm, I, is there wood anywhere that I can Yeah, touch? I'm touching it yes. here, don't worry. Okay, I'm touching it now. Um, so, you know, we've got to keep him fit, obviously, uh, because w I think that's part of the problem. Much as, you know, we can admire Dean Ketia for how the way he finished the season and the way he really took the beat, bit between his teeth and, uh, and, and produced the goods uh, when we were perhaps not expecting that from him. Um, with all due respect to him, he's certainly not on the same level, certainly not, not at this stage in his career. Mm. And, uh, um, but yes, uh, it, it, the, the recruitment has been quite spectacularly good when you compared to summers when we would have William and David Lewis coming in mm -hmm. um, and all those whose names I've probably forgotten. Best because forgotten. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, this time, 
I haven't seen the little Marquinhos from Sao Paulo. I don't know if you can tell me about him, but... Uh, I saw a little bit of him playing for the under-21. Some suggestion that he will go out on loan, but looked okay. quite good at under-21 level. Scored some goals, I think, in one game against Manchester United. But it may well be that, that he's going to go out on loan. I know that when Wolves were going to uh, bring him... Uh, in when there was that little bit of uh, hoo-ha over um, that situation. They had already set up a loan. I think it was Grasshoppers that he was going to go to to Mm -hmm. to sort of get used to European football. So it does look as if he might well uh, go out on loan. And the other thing as well uh, is that it's, it's a deeper squad, but it's a much smaller squad, which is a good thing. I mean, have you, have you made account of the number of players who were sold or, or went out on loan this summer? We do. It's crazy. We do have it's a spreadsheet. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's still more to do, obviously, because, you know, there's some guys on the fringes who, who aren't going to play. You think of Hector Bellerin, Ainsley Maitland-Niles, mm. Reese Nelson, I think, is going to be hampered by by injury. Um, you know, Pablo Marie's gone, Lucas Torreira's gone, Bern Leno's gone. So, you know, there are there are still some things to do in terms of, of departure. Departures. But can I ask you, just sort of going back to, to Gabriel Jesus, and yeah. look, um, I don't know what you can or what we could say that's in any way interesting or unique about a home debut in which a guy, uh, I think he took seven shots in total, scored twice, got two assists. I mean, where do you put that in the pantheon of home debuts? It's right up there with, with yeah. everything that you could possibly expect, and it should have been a hat trick. It could have been... Four, four or you know, it really could have been. It it was that good, but I mean, I'm curious more to explore this from the point of view of of a player who, until quite recently, did not see himself as a number nine because of the the, the trauma. Seems like the wrong word to use, but he had a mm. difficult experience at the 2018 World Cup. He played for Brazil, didn't score, and then was filled with a certain amount of self-doubt about his ability to play as a number nine. So he played wide for Brazil. He played wide for Manchester City. And it seems very, very clear that from the off, Arsenal's pursuit of Gabriel Jesus was as a number nine and to convince him that he could play that role. And again, with <laughs> I'm, I'm making these kinds of comparisons and everyone's going to roll their eyes, but it does mm. put you in mind of a certain uh, player who had to be convinced that he could be a striker could, yes, when, yes. He, when, he, when he signed from <laughs> Juventus. And again, look, I'm not saying Thierry Henry and Gabriel Jesus are the same player in any way, but there is a, a, oh, a very nice different little, anyway. I, I mean, they're very different yeah. because the, the one thing that I, I, I love about, about Jesus is, um, is his dribbling ability, yeah. which you, did, you didn't see much of, to be honest, at Manchester City because of the way they play and that the owners of the players who are on the flanks. Yeah. Certainly, yes, you can go past your defender, but the idea is that you go to the byline and you cross back, short uh, a short cross in the six-yard box mm. when somebody's rushing in, cutting the trajectory of the ball, uh, Gundogan, Sterling, whatever, and boom, it's a goal. And and they have and they play yep. on those triangles as well on on the uh, uh, on the flanks. Whereas now um, this Arsenal team, in a way. Um, that's why I say it's it 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 has a more improvisational quality about it. You see them try things that perhaps you wouldn't have seen them try no. last season or season before that, and things which are completely out of you know not in Manchester City's book. Whose well, strength is elsewhere? Yeah, I mean this is it. He 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 had some quotes to ESPN Brazil, right? And he mm-hmm. said. Um, it's normal to think that I can't play as a nine, that I'm a winger. I had this in my head for a long time. Now I have a different mindset and I believe in myself much more. Um, and he said, I, I, I went back to being what I was before. I'm no longer the robot that used to be there, which, you know, if you want to, robot, uh, if goodness. you want to um, view that as a, a little barb at, at Man City, I'm not sure it necessarily is, no. but, uh, you know, so h- how do we look at a player like this who's 25 years of age, loads of experience, played loads in the Premier League, but has come to Arsenal you know, and obviously had conversations with Mikel Arteta, had conversations with Edu about the role that they saw for him. And I think this is really fascinating that in a very short period of time, mm. they have sort of completely changed his mind about what you can be as a footballer. And it's really effective really quickly. 
Yes, uh, it shows as well the importance of doing your recruitment early in the transfer window. Mm. He, he arrived uh, 4th of July, I believe, I believe uh, at Arsenal. So he could immediately uh, have a full pre-season, full mm. training with, with Arteta. And, um, and that shows. Uh, I, it, what surprises me as well is the sharpness, which is perhaps, by the way, uh, a byproduct of his being freed from his robotic tasks uh, and discovering freedom. Mm. And he looks twice as sharp as he used to look for Manchester City. Honestly, yeah. it's simply electric. Uh, he also tries loads of things which he was not trying before. So obviously, yes, the confidence is there. And uh, and the proof of it is that he was actually quite annoyed after the first after uh, the game against Leicester because he, he said, I should have had four. And he was actually right. But obviously, he should have had four because he created the opportunities to score four or five goals. That, that's that's why. And so because he's exceptionally good. Um, and also, uh, crucially, there is already a wonderful understanding with the player for me who is Arsenal's future, uh, which is Gabriel Martinelli. Mm. Uh, I, I didn't think I could love that boy more, but <laughs> I, I, I'm loving him more and more and more by the day, uh, by the game. And he's absolutely terrifying. You, when he gets the ball, you get the feeling, well, no, they, they, they can't stop him. When you see how what he did to Fofana, who is supposed to be worth £85 million, um, and is a very good defender anyway, he absolutely put him on the rack. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and he has... Uh, the, the, uh, teams are very often based on relationships uh, between a couple of players or three players. And what was happening on the left in that particular game against Leicester was absolutely ravishing at times. Um, but it's not the only one, you know. We can, we talk about Jesus being feeling free and um, and and rever- reveling in this new ge- new role as a number nine. But I would say Granit Xhaka as well is reveling in his newly found freedom, it's, because that's the only way I can think of it. Because he's now in parts of the pitch where he never was before. It it became apparent last season that he was going or he was being asked to play a role which is different from the role he played. Mm for pretty much most of his Arsenal career. Um, This sort of um, mythical left eight, um, he's playing higher up the pitch, he's more involved in passes into the box. Um, Look, I know there are going to be Granite Xhaka doubters out there. There will always be Granite Xhaka doubters out there. Um, If people, you know, down the years have made their mind up about Granite Xhaka, that is absolutely fine. But... I, I think it's fair to say that he has improved in yes. that position. Like there, if you had doubts about him in that position, right? It's like, is he mobile enough? He probably won't ever be the most mobile player. We know that, but is he quick enough? Are his feet quick enough? I think his brain is um, quick enough, but it's it's been the execution it's too sometimes. Quick sometimes, yeah, sometimes is a little too quick to get going, but. Um, <laughs> You know, and look, uh, some people will laugh because he's done some silly things in the past. But what I think I've seen, uh, certainly over the last uh, few weeks in preseason, is a guy who is doing things at a much quicker pace than he used to. Yes. He's not dwelling on the ball. He's moving it. There's a lot of one-touch stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the, the performance against Leicester, where... He was making barnstorming Aaron Ramsey-esque runs into the box, into the back post. I mean, I did not think that I would ever see that from Granit Xhaka. Yeah, and uh, I, I have to say I, I have to eat my share of humble pie because there, there were times <laughs> at which I was despairing and thinking it really was the problem, not, not the solution, and that he was too slow. But the tempo of, um, of the team has increased uh, but it's increased uh, also because of Saliba. It's increased because also of Zinchenko now mm. playing. In fact, he doesn't play. He's a left back nominally, but in fact, he's a supplementary midfielder now. And he also brings the ball forward quite a lot. Um, it, the tempo seems to have increased in every single part of the pitch. And, uh, and, and Xhaka obviously is absolutely crucial for that because... He was at times too pedestrian. He was too lateral. Um, he was not daring enough. Uh, he could infuriate us by some 
some of his back passes to um, his central defenders, which had you thinking, my goodness, what is he doing now? And he seems to have taken this out of his repertoire, uh, which is great. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, obviously, they, they, it's, I don't know if it's just a belief. I don't know if this, the psychological factor is, is as important as that. Uh, if you listen to Mikel Arteta, quite clearly, the most important thing is the psychology, and um, which perhaps was not his forte because of his intensity and maybe he too has learned about that which is only normal you know he's still he's still the youngest manager in the premier league isn't mm. he yeah so, so yeah so and and this transmits to the players and and he also seems to be revealing in his role as a senior player i'm yes. talking about granny jacka here yeah seems to love it and um so yeah I'm basking again, but I never thought that we'd be basking about Granit Xhaka. But I was so impressed, and uh, by the by the performances, uh, these two performances, but especially the one against Leicester. Let me just go back to Gabriel Jesus again for mm. a second, because uh, you know, pleasure. yeah. So the the this is a, a, a substantial upgrade, right? In in position, um, you know, we've had problems at centre forward for about eighteen months. It's fair to say, yeah. and maybe you could extend that where. You know, the decision to buy Lacazette, then buy Aubameyang six months later, told you that, you know, that that strategy, that recruitment uh, plan wasn't really in place, or they had some doubts about Lacazette pretty much as soon as, as they bought him. And I don't want to make this a, a thing about Lacazette. I, I want to concentrate on the fact that we have upgraded. But you talk about Xhaka as one of the senior players. I'm sure you saw the story during the week um, where... Um, I think it was James reporting on The Athletic that after Martin Odegaard was made the captain, which I think we all thought was going to happen, the leadership group, if you like, was supplemented by Granit Xhaka, no surprise, but also Gabriel Jesus. How do you view that particular addition to the group? Because he's still a new player. Um, and he talked about not wanting to be the superstar or, or anything like that. And I think that humble part of his nature is... Which is why he's so popular yeah. in Brazil, by the way. He's immensely popular in Brazil because precisely of his humility. But, but then giving him the responsibility of the number nine, the number nine position, that role in the team, and now also a, a responsibility in the dressing room, you know, on the pitch and in the dressing room as well, you know, as part of that leadership group. I have to it, say, I think it's really smart, you know, if we're talking about I, I, how, yeah. how, he, how he develops, how he changes that mindset, how he sort of goes onto that pitch with uh, self-belief that's off the charts. I think, that's, I think that's a really smart move. I agree with you. In fact, I was going to say that, that um, he, the um, proactive choice of making him a member of the leadership group was the best way for his manager to show him how much he trusted him mm. and how much he believed in him and how much he believed he had the right qualities to do such a job and which obviously the player uh, appreciated a great deal and um, but I think as well you know you look up to a you know even if he hasn't been a central part of Manchester City's success it still has played a decent role in all the trophies they, they've won. So, mm. you know, all, every other player will look at him and, you know, have some, obviously, the, the due respect they should have. And also they've seen him on the training pitch where apparently he's an absolute beast. Um, and um, that's, that's also probably part of the, you know, the mm. reasons behind this decision, which, uh, again, I, I, I agree with you, was a very, very smart choice. It's, it's just, there's, um, we, we shall see uh, when... There is a bad loss, and there will be yeah. a bad loss at some point. How this holds up, but the feeling of unity we feel through the squad at the moment and through the club is something that I don't see in many other Premier League clubs at the moment, to be honest. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, just to sort of broaden it out a bit. And look, mm. there are there are some parallels between you know us last season and maybe Manchester United this season. And they've had a, a, an extremely difficult and hilarious start to the season, <laughs> right? So you know, yes. we if we're going to bask in we us being bask good, we well. can bask in that being bad. We're not we're not blind to the fact that things can change very quickly. But you know, football uh, is a game in which you should live in the moment as much as possible, particularly when that moment 
moment is filled with schadenfreude and hilarity at, at a club which you know down the years has caused us has caused us many problems but it, it does show you that trying to build something where to use an arteaism everybody is on the boat yep. isn't really easy you know you think okay you get a a bunch of good players together you pay them a lot of money you say look you're playing for one of the biggest clubs in the world that should be enough for everybody to go out and give their best on a saturday afternoon or a friday night or whenever it might be but it's not necessarily the case and you know we um as arsenal fans have had many doubts about our ownership about our trajectory about our direction and rightly so there's no two ways about that but it feels better now and mm-hmm. that's that's um comforting uh, but a club like manchester united to be where they are and and to be enduring the problems uh, that they're enduring i listened to a very interesting uh, interview this morning with with graham potter uh, the brighton manager who was speaking to michael calvin on his um his latest podcast and he was talking about that and talking about the idea that like it isn't just money and you can say where arsenal are right now is in no small part because we've spent money in the last 12 18 months we spent a lot of money and actually spent it well so that can make a big difference but he was making the point that there's got to be more there has to be more to it. And even going back to Man City, like they've spent a fuckload of money. We all know it, but they've also had an extremely well-run club from an executive level, uh, which has helped considerably in the success that they've had down the years. So, you know, when you're looking around at other clubs and, and clubs who uh, who have big resources and big fan bases, like uh, Liv- um Liverpool's wrong, like Manchester United, even like Chelsea to an extent, who are sort of a little bit wobbly at this moment in time. It does it does highlight the importance of that. Yes, and uh, that's one of the things that has made me um, try to think again about um, the current uh, hierarchy at Arsenal. Uh, the fact that they decided the way the club backed Arteta um, in the Obama Young. Uh, mm. you know, whatever it was that Did, mess to yeah. that awful mess but the club was very clear in backing him up that's one thing then the way that they asked him to extend his contract to sign a new contract after a series of three defeats not many other owners would have done that they would have actually started to think mm, maybe it's not working mm. but i'm wondering if there has been a change as well from um the owner's family, because, and I'm, and I'm, I'm wondering because, to be honest, I'm not saying I've got in the no information about that, but it seems to me that Josh Krunker is involved in a way that um, perhaps surprises me. And beyond the okay, I'll I'll send the son to to look after that. That keep him busy, you know, this kind of thing, <laughs> um, which you know, I, I know of one championship club where this is exactly what happened with hilarious results but i'll tell you when we're off air okay um (laughs) but uh in this particular case uh a he's not absent josh he seems to be there quite a bit of the time and um also there seems to be some kind of strategy in place this is amazing isn't it to see things like that Mm. and the strategy is based around actually entrusting the manager um, over a long-term project uh, after having uh, identified him as the right person to to lead that project and saying, yep, if we do that, we do it properly. And um, which, by the way, seems to be the case with every club that is going through uh, a decent phase at the moment. You, you look at you look at Brentford uh, with Thomas Frank. That's exactly what they've done. Uh, you talk, you look about Brighton, and you know I would have many things to say about the ownership of Brighton and and uh, and Brentford, uh, which they might not like to hear, but that's a different matter. If you talk <laughs> about purely what's going on in the ground in the strategy, as far as the club is concerned, what they've done is remarkably good, and um, absolutely remarkably good. You could say, well, obviously the same thing for Jurgen Klopp and Liverpool, long-term projects, and I also get the feeling that it's what Crystal Palace are trying to do with Patrick Vieira. Mm. And it's amazing how when you see, when you talk to fans of those clubs, how, well, they, they also buy into it. And an aside effect of that 
is that when the fans, fans like us, sense that there is a long-term project, a strategy in place, you're far more forgiving when it doesn't go right. Yes. And that helps the players a lot. The positivity, and this again, Arteta keeps going on about that, the fact that he can feel you know, the vibes from the crowd, but he's right. Uh, the Grove has totally changed in atmosphere since, you know, I would say November of uh, November 2021. It, it absolutely got nothing to do. People made a choice, decided, you know what, we're going to be to back our, our manager. We're going to back our young players. Mm. And, uh, and they've done it. And, and it's, to be honest, it's an absolute joy to go to the games, the home games at the moment. Well, I'm looking forward to getting over uh, yeah. this season, and um, uh, I'm I'm going to head over for the uh, the derby, the revenge derby, when we're uh, going to uh, put them to the sword, uh, <laughs> and I'm sure the atmosphere will be absolutely glorious that day. Oh, it would be something yeah. else, won't it? Yes. Just just finally, Philippe, I just wanted to ask your opinion on. Look, I don't want to have a big thing about officiating or anything else, but we've mm. had some issues. Um, Plenty of them. You know, in, in the couple of games, and there have been some manager spats on the sideline, which have been, yep. you know, it depends, you know, what you find amusing and what you don't. Um, some people might think it's silly to grown men going at it like that. Others might say that is really one of the funniest things I've, I've seen in a long time, and I'd like to see a lot more of it. But I, you can say both, you know. Yeah, you yeah that's both true. Things. Maybe true. But, um, you know, there was an incident in that game where um, the Spurs defender Romero um, pulled Cucurella, uh, Cucurella by the hair and yep. the referee didn't give a foul. And I don't really understand how that's possible. I know there's no specific law in the game about hair pulling, but it strikes <laughs> me that if you grab a guy... It's and, violent conduct. Uh, yeah. At the very least, uh, it's unsportsmanlike conduct, but it's it's violent conduct if you grab a guy by bloody the hair hurts. and pull it him yeah hurts. i mean god bless those people that still have hair um you know i'm slightly well, yeah. envious of that but you know there seems to be a repeat of that edict which was there at the start of last season where uh, referees were being encouraged perhaps not um publicly to to let it flow is the um is is the thing that we're hearing and i do wonder about that because look on the one hand i think there are certain fouls fouls in inverted comma within the game that we could do without and that's the you know where a a player is shielding the ball and he thrusts his backside into the op uh, opponent, falls over, lands on the ball, picks it up in the fine knowledge that he is going to get a free kick. You know, those kind of things we could probably do without. But I wonder how they find the balance between letting the game go, letting some tackles go that normally people would be screaming about, and that may be tipping over into... A slight recklessness perhaps on behalf of some of the players who think well I got away with that one I can go yeah. in on this one and you know there is a World Cup coming up there is a weird schedule coming up injuries are going to be a factor this season and they might be because of fatigue they might be because of the weird schedule but I do worry a little bit that we're going to see maybe one or two injuries um, emerge because referees have allowed players a bit more leeway to go in stronger or faster or harder in tackles. Yeah, but only um, well, in some occasions, and in some occasions they haven't done that. Mm. That's that's the thing. The the letting the game flow is so vague and ambiguous. Yeah. For example, when uh, there were two fouls, I, I know that all football fans will think that the re referees are biased against them. That's it's just part of our psyche. But there were two occasions where fouls were given against Gabriel Martinelli, who was simply stronger yeah. than whoever was uh, at left back, at uh, right back, excuse me, for Leicester uh, on that occasion. And he didn't barge into the players. It was an old fashioned shoulder charge, perhaps, mm -hmm. or it could have been interpreted as that. But given what had been let go, uh, of uh, during the the rest of the game, you thought, how can that be a foul? So if that was a foul, it should have been a foul in the other end, and blah blah yeah. blah. And and it feeds as well all the conspiracy theories because, uh, as you know, what ha what's happened with Anthony Taylor in that that hilarious game between um, Chelsea and, and Tottenham. Um, but maybe I, I'm going to be generous here. Maybe you have to give the refs a little bit of time to get used to uh, applying these new. Uh, 
this new advice mm. in the real world. It's only been two rounds of the Premier League. It's nothing. And there have been some problems here, some problems there. But there have also been games where, honestly, there haven't been any problems whatsoever. And the games have flowed, flowed uh, a little bit more easily. But it's true that um, there is an ambiguity here. And um, I personally, I have such a problem with tactical fouling um, that, okay, letting the game f the game flow, yeah, well, perhaps, but if it means that I'm going to slow down the game and you play an advantage, which in football is ridiculously short, which is also one of my big primes, advantage shouldn't be over the next pass. It should be over the next three or four passes. Mm. You know, if the ball has gone backward, you should go be able to blow the whistle, say, no, no, no advantage, we go back. And very few refs do it. Uh, but when I see a player like Hoiberg, for example, who is a specialist of that, I mean, he's a, he's a tactical, one of the great tactical foulers of, of the Premier League. And he's got away with stuff, which was absolutely incredible, honestly. Mm. And, and it, quite cleverly, because he wouldn't break down the action completely, but he would commit a foul that would slow it down. And the ref would say, well, carry on playing. We've got to let the game flow. No, no free kick, nothing. Yeah. And which, of course works in his advantage because if you give two, three, four of these free kicks, well, the, the card is going to come. After the third one, you're probably going to get a card. But since they let him carry on, I think for tactical foulers, this idea of letting the game flow is just wonderful. Yeah. And I do have a problem with that. I'm not saying you should be super, super strict, but there are things you should be stricter about. And uh, it, 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 it all comes from a, a, a laudable desire to speed up the game, to to prevent, you know, breaks in play and so forth. Okay, fine, I understand that. But so far, it hasn't been entirely convincing in, you know, certainly a couple of cases. Let's let's give them time to see, you know, maybe we should have this conversation again in a month or so or yeah. after the international break and, and when we have a time to reflect a little bit. Uh, the other thing as well, I'm, I'm, I would be very interested to see how the players who play in the Premier League are going to adapt their game when they will have to play in the Nation's League well, who cares? Or and, in Europe. Uh, but it's in the World Cup and in Europe. In Europe, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Where the same, the, you know, it's not exactly the same. It's the same laws which apply, but it's not exactly the same way to uh, to apply them. Mm. So that could be a problem for English clubs, including ourselves. Yeah, that is a very interesting idea, isn't it? Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wait and see. Like you say, maybe we'll have this conversation uh, again in mm -hmm. um, a few weeks' time and see where we are with it and see which managers have um, pulled each other's hair on the sidelines uh, <laughs> for our amusement. Uh, we better leave it there for now, though. Philippe, as always, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed to Philippe. You can find him on Twitter. He is at Philippe Auclair, at Philippe Auclair. Now, last week, we ran a competition to give away a print, a cool Thierry Henry print, illustrated by uh, an Arsenal fan, Noah McMillan, who passed away very sadly recently. We had so many entries and so many people uh, uh, with messages of condolence uh, about Noah and to his family on his passing that I thought just one wouldn't be enough. So we're going to give away three of them, okay? So three prizes. Um, if you didn't win, if you're not one of the lucky people who won and you'd still like one of these prints they are available to buy so you'll find a link in the show notes so if you would like one of those prints that is where you get them anyway all the entries went into a, a digital hat so to speak and the random number generator has picked out three names patrick roach jeffrey renault and joel yentis you three guys uh, have won the prints. I'll be in touch with you separately. I'll get your details uh, and I'll get the prints uh, sent out to you. To the rest of you, like I said, if you want to buy one, you can do it. The link is in the show notes. And once again, uh, to Noah, rest in peace and our condolences to his family and friends. Right. That is just about that for this week's show. As I said, we'll be talking Bournemouth over on Patreon. Myself and Lewis will do our Premier League preview podcast. As always, we'll have that for you tomorrow. So patreon.com forward slash arsblog if you want to sign up and get access to that. If you're already a member, thank you so much for your continued support. That podcast will drop for you um, on Friday afternoon. We'll also be doing over the weekend probably our All or Nothing podcast. Myself and Phil Costa will look back at the final two episodes of All or Nothing, eventful as they were, for better and for worse. And uh, indeed, for sometimes it was for worse. Anyway, let's hope for much better this weekend. James and I will 
be here on Sunday again with the Arscast Extra. So join us for that. Until then, take it easy, folks. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye-bye. What's going on down there? It's Gary. He says he won't do it. What? He's literally locked himself in his dressing room. He says there's no way. Not a chance. That little cunt. He knows fine well what the plan is. We rehearsed this. Oh no, oh no. Listen, I was in the meetings. I've tried talking to him, but he's locked the door. And he said something about how he can't see what the strategy is. Strategy? I'll fucking give him strategy now in a minute. He knows fine well when Brentford beat a big team at home, he's got to fucking dance. And if he doesn't fucking dance for me now, I'll fucking wring his neck. All right, look, I'll, g I'll give it one more try. Gary? Gary, you've got to come out. Gary? Gary? Oh, for fuck's sake. He's gone. Gone where? He's, uh, climbed out the toilet window. Right, there's only one thing for it. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Send soonest after him. But before you do, tell him women now have the right to vote. Jesus. He's gonna fucking murder him.